General Motors, already a force to be reckoned with, became an industrial powerhouse in the years following World War II. No other vehicle manufacturer could match it in resources, personnel, or influence. To get an idea of their dominance, just look at their numbers. In 1955, GM became the first American company to earn a billion dollars in profit, and all signs pointed toward even stronger growth in the future. As the corporation tightened its grip on the industry, the Pontiac division began to slip. No one could deny the fact that the brand produced stout, reliable vehicles, but in the age of tail fins and chrome, that simply wasn't enough. Car buyers craved style, performance, and excitement, traits that Pontiac's cars lacked. It also found itself sandwiched between the entry-level Chevrolet and the mid-range Oldsmobile. Without a unique selling point, Pontiac risked getting lost in the shuffle. A Forbes article quotes author J. Patrick Wright, who said that Pontiac was really in trouble and went on to state that it was, quote, like an old person's division. Drastic changes had to be made to right the ship, so in 1956, the company took a chance. Seaman Bunky Knudsen took over as a general manager. At just 43 years old, he was the youngest division head in GM history up to that point. Knudsen got Pontiac's reinvention going by overseeing its entrance into NASCAR and NHRA competition. He also shook up its engineering division and brought in some fresh faces, including a young gun by the name of John Z. DeLorean. He'd made a name for himself at Chrysler and Packard. Knudsen lured him away from GM's crosstown rival by making him an offer that he couldn't refuse a $16,000 salary. That's about $180,000 when adjusted for inflation. DeLorean assisted in the creation of the next generation of Pontiacs, including the first generation Tempest. The compact car got younger buyers into showrooms and signaled the brand's turnaround. Even more products were in the pipeline. In December of 1962, the division began developing a four-seat sports coupe under the code name of XP798, or Scorpion. A 2018 curbside classic article states that it was an evolution of the two-seat XP788 project. Chevrolet even signed on in the hope of developing a four-seat Corvette, but it dropped out soon after. As work on this project got underway, Pontiac broke ground on arguably its most iconic product of this period, According to an article from Horsepower Memories, John DeLorean spent many of his weekends brainstorming with engineers Bill Collins and Russ G. at the Milford Proving Grounds. On one such occasion, they were examining a prototype 1964 Le Mans. Collins mentioned that they could probably fit a 389 V8 in there with no issue. Pontiac's newfound ingenuity was on display here. General Motors had a rule on the books that limited engine displacement to one cubic inch per 10 pounds of vehicle weight. Under normal circumstances, they would not have been able to put the engine in the Le Mans. They found a loophole in the mandate. It only applied to base engines. No such restriction applied to optional engines, so the GTO was an option package that included the 389. Pontiac released the car in September of 1963 to critical and commercial acclaim. In a few short years, the brand went from an unfashionable mark to one that was on the rise. How would it follow this up? With XP833, a low-cost two-seat sports car, Fielding an entrant into the lower end of this market seemed like a sound decision because American automakers had largely ignored it. Pontiac had to act quickly though. It feared that stiff competition was right around the corner. Ford was undoubtedly the most likely of its rifles to release a sporty two-seater. The Thunderbird had come out about a decade prior, and while that car had evolved since then, it's illustrated that Ford knew how to make a sports car with a wide appeal. A few show cars hinted at a return to this segment. The 1962 Mustang 1 concept relied on finesse rather than outright speed, with a rear-mounted inline-4 engine, fully independent suspension, and a curb weight of just 1,544 pounds. It was too spartan to be truly mainstream, but a more civilized version could attract a few buyers. 
Fordenveld another concept in 63. The Cougar II was a more grounded sports car that would pose an even greater threat to the XP833. Visceral performance would have been the focus here, given the fact that it was built upon the bones of a Shelby Cobra. According to a Hemmings article, it was chassis CSX 2008. Its 260 inch cubic inch V8 also helped propel it to a claimed top speed of 170 miles an hour. Ford showed it at the 1963 Chicago Auto Show in February, so it was certainly on Pontiac's radar. They were more than aware. A 1989 Special Interest Autos article contains excerpts from a brochure that it made to sell GM executives on the idea of a Pontiac sports car. The division singled this car out and went on to say, We are convinced we must introduce our sports car in 1967 in order to protect our position hopefully beating Ford to the punch. Another potential rival was, surprisingly, the production Mustang. It didn't seem like a perfect match to the surface because it was a four-seater and the XP833 was envisioned as a lightweight two-seater. The brochure laid out their logic, saying that it, quote, would appeal strongly to the youth market as well as to those who did not buy a Mustang because it was not the honest sports car they had hoped it would be. I suspect that Pontiac also drew this comparison to ease concerned about the XP833 competing with the Corvette. Pontiac also made heavy use of existing components. The brochure stated that about 80% of the chassis components were the standard A-body parts. SIA said that this was similar to the approach that Ford took with the Mustang. By doing this, they were able to save a great deal on tooling and development costs. The company used this strategy to great success, so it's no wonder why Pontiac took it up as well. According to a curbside classic article, several proposals were constructed and assigned designations from SP1 to SP6. SP1 through SP4 were non-functional mock-ups. Our attention will be focused on SP5 and SP6. The former was a coupe that was equipped with a Pontiac overhead cam 6. Colin said that this one was envisioned as the volume model. SP6 was a convertible that had a 326 V8 under the hood. This engine choice was odd because it served as another point of comparison with the Corvette. Such links could potentially jeopardize the 833's fate. Weight figures for the SP5 and SP6 vary from source to source. The 6 weighed between 2,200 and 2,300 pounds, while the V8 model weighed between 2,600 and 2,900 pounds. In a 2012 Motor Trend Classic article, Bill Collins said that its design was inspired by the Chevrolet Corvair Monza GT from 1962. Aside from the vents at the bases of their windshields, there isn't much connected them from the front. More of the influence comes through in the side and rear views. Look at the shape of the front and rear haunches. The mid-engine Monza GT is more curvaceous, but the XP833 follows it in spirit. A curve on the lower half of the body gives the Pontiac a bit of muscle. Creases also trail the rear windows and stop just short of the edge. This adds more definition and emphasizes the shoulders. Again, the effect is more pronounced on the Monza GT, but it can still be made out on the 833. Some say that the Mako Shark 2 concept was also a source of inspiration for the car, and at a glance, there are a few links. Both have long hoods, pointy chromed front ends, thin A-pillars, and flared wheel arches. Colin shut this down, directly stating that the team looked to the Monza GT for inspiration and not the Mako Shark 2. It was finally time to pitch the car to GM management. Sources differ on exactly when it took place. Some state that it happened in mid-1964, while others say 1965. They stressed the car's low development costs as well as how it diverged from the Corvette. According to the documentation, they aimed for a 1967 launch as well as a base price of $2,500. This was a relative bargain compared to the Corvette, which started at about $4,200. Ideally, this would slot it in a different segment and therefore appeal to a different customer base. The Curbside Classic article gives an idea of what its competitors could have looked like. In terms of pricing, 
it would have been on par with cars like the Triumph TR4 and Austin Healey and above vehicles such as the Spitfire. Development costs, meanwhile, were estimated between $15 and $18 million. Things seemed to be in their favor initially. Bill Mitchell, GM's Vice President of Design, was present, and he was surprised to see not one, but two running prototypes. An outright yes, however unlikely, would have been ideal. Getting sent back to the drawing board was more of a possibility, but that would have at least given them more time. Instead, the higher-ups outright cancelled the project. In a 2012 interview with Motor Trend Classic, Collins said that the car was about 80% ready for production. He also revealed that they spent weeks trying to change their minds, to no avail. Oftentimes, rejected proposals get sent to the scrapyard. The XP833 managed to cheat death. Engineers Bill Collins and Bill Killen hid both cars away in shipping containers. Production may have been off the table, but they were at least able to preserve the culmination of their blood, sweat, and tears. The Pontiac division had something else in the works. Remember the XP798? The four-seat coupe had come into its own by 1966. By this point, it had retired the Scorpion moniker and adopted the Banshee name. Some elements, such as the chromed two-party grille and central hood crease, are shared between it and the 833. The Banshee does more than enough to stand on its own, though. The long, low, and wide dimensions make it look downright exotic. According to a Pontiac press release, it's nearly 197 inches long, and it also had a 109-inch wheelbase. In between the axles are massive doors. Pontiac said they were 20 inches longer than conventional ones. Opening doors that large would turn into a tour pretty quickly, but the company considered this as well. They open by sliding parallel to the body. And that isn't all. There is a pair of gullwing doors on the roof that makes accessing the rear seats easier. Pontiac had planned on showing the Banshee at the 1966 New York Auto Show as a concept. This doesn't necessarily mean that GM had plans to build it. But if it received a warm enough reception, then perhaps it could have become a consideration. They wouldn't even get the chance. Management stonewalled them at the last moment. The book Original Pontiac Firebird and Trans Am, 1967-2002, to The Restorer's Guide, by Jim Shild, states that GM President James Roach didn't think it complied with Pontiac's image of safety. Although it never saw the light of day, the Banshee found a way to endure. John DeLorean left a promising career at GM in 1973 to establish his own company. Bill Collins planned on joining him, but first, he had some unfinished business to attend to. His babies were still packed away in those shipping containers. The company didn't give the time of day back then, and since then, they'd let it gather dust. This wasn't likely to change anytime soon, so Collins and Killen took matters into their own hands. They walked into the GM purchasing department and asked to buy the cars. Thankfully, they were able to come to an agreement. Killen took home the six-cylinder coupe while Collins got the V8 convertible. Something didn't feel right, though. The cars didn't have names, or real ones at least. Internal designations have their place, but XP833 wouldn't mean a damn thing outside the confines of the GM Technical Center. How would they be known in their new lives? Collins had an idea. At this point, the Banshee was long gone. Its script badges had been left behind, though. Collins grabbed them and placed one in each car. Nearly a decade after their creation, the cars finally had identities. Banshee embodied the vigor, excitement, and ambition of a new Pontiac. It was a reminder of what could have been.